Hello. Our story begins on the planet Meridun. It was the first year of the Clone Wars and the Jedi were pinned down with a couple of clone troopers on a remote world with a primitive population. The people here were the Lerman, and they had no intention of being around the Clone Wars, but the Separatist commander, Locke Durd, was testing out a new experimental Separatist weapon. Currently, Anakin Skywalker was badly injured. He saved Ayla Secura, the few clones, and his Padawan from an explosion that ripped apart half of a Venator-class Star Destroyer only a day before. The crash landing didn't really help either, that came right afterwards. Anakin was dealing with numerous broken bones and severe head trauma. Of course, being so attuned with the Force, he would likely make a full recovery once he got to a Republic-grade medical facility, but that wasn't here on Meridum. The Jedi spent a few days here on the planet, and during those days, Anakin was able to finally get off the ground and stand on his own, which, when he was ready, so were the Separatists. In a daring move, the Jedi stole shield generators from the Separatists and placed them inside of the Lerman village and prepared a defense for the droid forces that had arrived. They had to beat the droids, or at the very least stall until the Republic arrived. It was a challenging feat, but the three Jedi and two clones were up to the challenge. Commander Bly and Captain Rex held their own, and Anakin Skywalker, despite his numerous injuries, would do everything in his power to stop the Separatist commander before he obliterated the entire Lerman population. Anakin used his lightsaber to cut through the battle droids and eventually through the massive weapon, while his allies defended the peaceful Lerman and defeated the rest of the droid forces. A victory wouldn't be complete without the arrival of a Venator-class Star Destroyer. Anakin needed to get some healing done, and instead of doing his full recovery instead of the Venator, he would be dispatched back to Coruscant to recover. He was going to meet up with his former master anyways, and Ahsoka would be stationed inside of the Jedi Temple to do some extra training with Jedi Master Plo Koon, who was currently not on a campaign. The Jedi would take a shuttle and depart for Coruscant, while Admiral Yularen and the rest of the Republic fleet grouped up in the Roland Sector of the Outer Rim, where Meridun was located. Anakin told Ahsoka that he was very proud of her for the hard work that she did during their mission on the native planet. Those people being so cut off from the galaxy would typically be hard to talk to and negotiate with, but she did a fine job of making sure that every party was appeased. Of course, Anakin wasn't a part of everything, but for what he saw, it seemed like Ahsoka did a good job. Ayla Sakura, the Jedi who was also with them on Meridun, told Anakin that his Padawan did a very fine job as well. Currently, Ayla and Commander Bly were being dispatched to regroup with the rest of their forces elsewhere in the Outer Rim. When Skywalker returned to the temple, he was immediately ushered to the medical wing of the Jedi Temple. He was put under for a good moment so that the droids could work on his broken bones. Republic military personnel, or essentially medical droids, could typically reduce the pain of broken bones so that it wouldn't be felt in combat. This was done to Master Plo Koon when he and his men returned from the Battle of Korm. It was the same battle where Plo Koon broke one of his arms and was forced to defend himself from the extremely talented Asajj Ventress. It was a tough task, but he was able to do that, and when he returned to the Venator, after the battle, he was given the same treatment, though it was a bit more extreme considering Keldor bone structure was much different than human bone structure. Anakin's bone structure, especially in the ribs area, where he was injured, would take longer to heal, and the medical droids suggested he didn't get into too many acrobatic situations. Being a Jedi, he could handle it, but it could rupture the splint they put over his stomach to keep his ribs from shattering or impaling his lungs. It was Republic technology. Using a slight incision that wouldn't be noticeable after removed, the medical droids magnetized Anakin's ribs, and the cover they put over it was also magnetized. They learned that doing this allowed the bones to heal faster, and for Anakin it would take only about a week or two until he could finally take off his splint and be perfectly fine. When Anakin woke up, his master walked in and told him they would be going to the planet Orto Platunta and the Sujumi sector where Pantora was. They were going on a mission with Chairman Chow and Senator Chuchi. Anakin asked why they were going out there, to which Kenobi told him that the people of Pantora, specifically Chairman Chow, was worried about a Separatist invasion, despite there both being a Republic and Separatist outpost on the planet. Though, they lost contact with the Republic outpost, and they were being requested to go there to investigate. Anakin nodded his head, suggesting that Obi-Wan get Captain Rex and some of the men of the 501st ready and outfitted with their snow gear and prepare for the mission. Anakin then told Obi-Wan that he'd be in Obi-Wan's flagship within the coming hours. Kenobi nodded his head and left. A moment after the door closed behind him, Anakin jumped up and ran towards the edge of the room and grabbed his robes. He had time to go and visit his wife. He hadn't yet seen her since he brought her back to Naboo after the Battle of Genosis, well technically it was when he rescued her from the Malevolence, but still. It was hard doing a relationship in distance, but he had time to see her and he was so excited. 
Anakin radioed Pat in his office inside the Senate building, and nothing came through. The Senate wasn't in session, maybe she was feeling under the weather, because Padme was always in her office, and if she wasn't, the call would be directed to her Republic-issued Senator communicator. That wasn't the case, so Anakin flew across the city to Padme's residence, where he docked on the side and walked in. Anakin saw Padme's stuff and knew that she was here, but what could she possibly be doing? There had to be something wrong. Anakin called out Padme's name, and there was not a sound. Anakin started walking into the main part of the complex, as he walked through the hallways heading towards Padme's room. When he got there, he saw her lying on her bed, completely asleep. Anakin walked in and sat down on her side of the bed, brushing her hair out of her face and feeling her head to make sure her temperature was alright. Her temperature wasn't too high, but she was in a deep sleep apparently. Anakin then heard the moving of gears and he turned over and saw C-3PO. He smiled and stood up, walking over to the droid he constructed, and essentially his wedding gift to his wife. Anakin asked if she was alright, to which C-3PO told Anakin that she was perfectly fine, though there was something that he should see. Anakin was a bit confused, but he followed the protocol droid. As they walked through the corridors, Anakin asked what was wrong. C-3PO didn't say a thing, pressing a button on a door and moving out of the way. Anakin looked at the protocol droid and stepped through the door. Inside, there were two pods, and inside of each pod were children. Anakin whipped his head around and asked 3PO whose kids these were, and the droid responded gleefully that the children belonged to him. Anakin asked if Padme adopted them. 3PO shook his head, and then Padme came around the corner. She smiled and told Anakin that they were his children. She'd given birth while he was out on campaign. Currently, she was on maternal leave from the Senate, even though no one knew who the father was. Padme told the Senate that she kept the father hidden because he didn't like being in the public spotlight. Anakin smiled, telling her that that was half a truth. Padme was very happy to see Anakin, but they had a lot to talk about regarding the situation. This changed everything. The war was still very early on and it required the attention of everyone, including both of them. Though Padme couldn't be a part of it, and currently, Representative Jar Jar Binks was filling the role of Senator for Padme, just as he had during the first few days before the Clone Wars. Padme told Anakin that she'd like to raise the children on Naboo, but with the Separatists all around the mid-rim, she didn't believe it was safe to raise her kids on Naboo at the moment. Anakin told Padme that he'd be willing to leave the Jedi Order to help, and he really would. But Padme put her hand on Anakin's mouth and started to shake her head. While yes, there was concern for Anakin to be taken out of the war by the Jedi, he was necessary to bringing peace. Of course Padme wanted Anakin to be with her to raise their kids, but the war wasn't nearly completed. There was no sign of end in sight, and she would rather raise her children in a galaxy that wasn't covered in war. If the Separatists won, then her children would become slaves, and she didn't want that for them. Of course, that could be an exaggeration, but the Separatists were ruthless, and she didn't want to imagine what they would do in the circumstance they captured a Republic Senator, let alone one they had tried to kill numerous of times before. Padme told Anakin that within a month, she'd be able to actively serve inside the Senate again. They would have to be present in this war, they couldn't just not be. They had a duty to those who were helpless. Plus, C-3PO would be a perfect caretaker for the children. Anakin nodded his head. As he turned around and asked what their names were, Padme walked up to Anakin's side, wrapping her arm around him and telling him that she wanted to wait for him to return so that they could name the children together. Anakin smiled and walked up to their little pods. He smiled and said the boy looked like a Luke. Padme nodded her head in agreeance. As she spoke up, she then said that she would prefer if both the children had the same first letter of each of their names. They were twins, it would be nice to keep them kind of close. Anakin rubbed his chin. First he said Linda, Luna, Lucy. Something didn't feel right about those names, though Luna Skywalker did have a nice ring to it. Padme walked over and looked at the child, and said a couple more L names. Some of them are more common within mid-rim worlds, such as Naboo. She turned to Anakin and smiled. Anakin asked what the name was before Leia came out of Padme's mouth. It was a perfect name. It worked really well, too, because both Luke and Leia had four-letter names. Anakin got a communication on his comlink. It was Obi-Wan. Kenobi told Anakin that they were preparing to jump to hyperspace. It was time to get to the flagship so that they could resolve this little problem on Orto Plutonia. Anakin told his master he would be right there. Anakin gave his love to his wife and his two new, sudden children, and departed towards the flagship. During the entire mission to Orto Plutonia, Anakin was off of his game. It was a good thing he was off of his game here, because had it happened elsewhere, like on a battlefield, he would have been in a struggle. The entire mission revolved around making a deal with a local population who was very, very primitive. Much more primitive than the Lumerans. 
Though Anakin couldn't focus on being here to help, he was too focused on how to hide his children. There's a chance the Jedi would pick up on it, because they were so force sensitive, and they would try and drag Luke and Leia into the Jedi Order. Anakin was also befuddled as to why Padme never said anything about it, but likely it was to avoid him worrying about anything. After all, only five months before they saw each other when she was captured aboard the Malevolence before it slammed down onto a random moon and explosion. Obi-Wan picked up on Anakin's distance from the situation. While he knew Anakin wasn't exactly a fan of diplomacy, and specifically focused on his usage of a lightsaber during aggressive negotiations, this was odd even for Anakin. He wasn't just disconnected from the diplomacy, he was disconnected everywhere. There wasn't a period since he arrived on the Venator of which he was normal by any means. Obi-Wan was mostly concerned if the war was taking a toll on Anakin's mentality, because the war was difficult on everyone, but most people didn't wear it on their sleeves, especially not their emotions the way Anakin did. Obi-Wan initially assumed that when he broke some of his ribs, that maybe Anakin was afraid of being killed in combat, but even he knew it wasn't that. With Anakin, it was always something deeper than what it initially seemed like on the surface level. When Anakin and Obi-Wan left the primitive camp, they told the chairman about the request made by the natives, to which the chairman objectively freaked out. He couldn't imagine bartering with animals that couldn't even speak galactic common, let alone use superior technology, they were below him. He was insulted in the Jedi's way of thinking, but considering Chairman Chow thought that Ordo Plutonia belonged to Pantora, he was willing to wipe out all these natives in an effort to claim his own presence over the planet just to prove a point about superior technology. The Jedi disagreed with it, and so did Senator Chuchi. This would lead into a destructive conflict that cost the lives of Chairman Chow, multiple or all of his guards, and several of the clone troopers that came here to aid. When everything was seemingly resolved, Kenobi took Anakin aside and began talking to him. He was worried about his former student. He didn't want Anakin feeling like he was alone in all of this, and so he told his student that he would be here to help him if he needed it. Anakin pushed Obi-Wan away though. He didn't want to be forced from the Jedi Order, because there was no scenario in which Anakin would be able to effectively get away with having a family. Having two children, a wife, and being in love with them wasn't okay. Though maybe there was a way. No, there wasn't, never mind. The only way it would work is if, before Anakin could finish his thoughts, a communication came in from Naboo. Representative Banks had gone to the planet to investigate a weird occurrence that had been going on for a number of days. And then, it was awful. It wasn't just part of the planet, it was the entire planet, hit by a super weapon. Though, it wasn't meant to go off. Instead, it was an accident. The Separatist doctor, Nuvo Vindi, was responsible for bringing back a virus that had been dead for millennia. It was specifically wiped out to ensure that it didn't continue to hurt people because it could infect every living being. The Blue Shadow virus was a virus that could infect anything that lived. When Jar Jar went out to investigate the issue, he went on a covert op in the forest of Naboo, where he was discovered by the Separatists. Though being as clumsy as he was, he fell into a hole, kicking a blaster rifle, and then the blaster shot the little service droid that Dr. Vindi had around the lab. The droid dropped the bomb, and it exploded. Within moments, Dr. Vindi and Jar Jar were infected. Shortly after that, all of Naboo was exposed, and not long after that, killed. The entire planet was being killed slowly but surely. The Blue Shadow virus didn't target anyone. It wasn't about survival of the fittest. Its only parameters were to kill. Nothing less. And that's what it did. Republic executives watched as the planet died slowly. No one outside of the Republic military structure, the Senate, or the Jedi knew about this. They kept it on the down low, because how else could the Republic inform its people that a mad scientist released the most toxic weapon known in the galactic history on an entire planet? It said something too, because even Sidious feared this, and he was livid considering the fact that Dr. Vindi, who was associated with Count Dooku, likely did this on behalf of the Count. While Palpatine was from Naboo, he wasn't too upset about this, but he saw this as a great way to levy extreme amounts of executive power away from the Senate, because he needed to be pitied. Palpatine didn't care, but he was a fantastic actor, and with the brilliant acting skills, he won over the Senate, with his pity party, telling the Senate that the Separatists needed to be stopped. And the first effort would be to go to the planet of Naboo to recover any data and use this terrible bomb against the Separatists. Not all the Senate was on board with this, but they were on board with the idea of taking the bomb and the chemicals away from Naboo, just in case. 
Palpatine sent the largest sector fleet to Naboo, guided by Jedi Master Plo Koon and the Wolf Pack. The Wolf Pack was known for their expertise in extractions, plus Master Plo Koon's mask would give him enough time to breathe in the planet to retrieve the materials. The clones went down to the surface with him and they would be wearing protective gear too. The entire goal was to retrieve this deadly virus and take every single vial and remove it from Naboo and take it to a secret Republic facility, guided by Jedi Master Plo Koon of course. The landing procedure was difficult, the entire planet was covered in a blue mist. When they landed, the clones had a total of 30 minutes to get to the bomb chamber to retrieve the toxic weapon and get off the planet before their air tanks ran out. Plo Koon had 25 minutes, so in reality the clones had 25 minutes to get in and get out. The clones landed and exited their gun ship, and began to descend into the base. They weren't expecting droids, but they ran into battle droids immediately because, well, they weren't affected by the explosion of the bomb. They had no orders, and so immediately a firefight broke out. Plo got in front of his men and began cutting down the droids. He yelled back and told his men to find the bombs and get a hold of them. They had 22 minutes to work with. The main hallways were cleared out, but the undeniable sound of destroyer droids made Plo move the rest of his men towards searching for the vials of the toxic weapon. He got in front of his men, doing everything he could to get rid of the destroyers. On the other side of the base, Commander Wolf and his men barge into the bomb room. He sent the coordinates to everyone in his squad and began unpacking the bombs and placing them into backpacks. They had 13 minutes left by this time, and they got everything together, which for Plo meant they really had 8 minutes left. It was a bit of an uncomfortable situation to be in. When they had all the bombs, they made their way towards the exit, but it was blocked by droids. Seven minutes left. Plo cut down the droids, as he used a force to push any and all the battle droids out of his way. He got to the ladder and told his men to climb. He would be right behind them. Six minutes left. The men began to climb the ladder. The LAAT was nowhere to be found. Outside, there were more battle droids awaiting the clones, though they were hidden under the mist of the blue smoke. That meant the virus was getting thicker, and the LAAT was just hidden behind the smoke. The clones took cover and began firing. After all the men were out of the bunker, Plo jumped up and closed the latch behind him. Plo turned around and began helping his men with extracting themselves. Using his vision with the force, and even through the darkness of the blue smog, he located the LAAT and told his men where to go and direction. Four minutes left. The clones fired away, cutting down the few droids they came across. Plo told the LAAT to take off. All the clones were on board, but he wasn't. He slashed away, and then when he saw the LAAT lift into the air, he leapt up with the force and landed in the doorway of the vessel, as the ship sped its way out of the planet's atmosphere to the Venator above. With all the Blue Shadow virus taken and captured, it was time the galaxy learned of what happened here at Naboo. 600 million lives were lost, and that wasn't even counting the millions of other life forms on the planet. It was just a catastrophic occasion, and for Palpatine, it worked in his favor. He could perpetuate the war to continue on longer, and now he had a weapon that he could use anytime, anywhere. The Blue Shadow Virus was being transported to Mount Tantus on Wayland, though Palpatine was very unaware that Jedi Master Plo Koon was going there as well. When Plo learned of Tantus, he informed the Council about the fact that the Chancellor was keeping secrets from the Jedi, as well as giving precise location for this base and all the details he could find about it. Plo found this very peculiar. Anakin and Padme, on the other hand, were dealing with this crisis. Padme was still not allowed back into the Senate for maternity leave, and Anakin happened to be back on world. It was during the same period of time that bounty hunter Cad Bane held a number of representatives captive, so he get a hold of Zero the Hut for a bounty. Padme was terribly sad. It was an incredibly depressing time for her. Everything she ever knew was lost. Anakin tried to console her, but what could you do when the love of your life loses her entire planet? The planet isn't just a family, it's locations, memories, places, history, everything that made her, her. Padme's pain was immeasurable, and Anakin could feel all of her suffering. It was truly horrific. He did everything he could for her. While this was going on, the entire Republic learned about the events at Naboo, and the Republic backlash was incredibly high. People couldn't believe that the Separatists would do such a thing. The loss at Naboo was combined worse than any casualty over the last combined 1500 years. It was an absolute travesty, and it ripped the heart out of the galaxy. Separatists were outraged at Count Dooku when Palpatine was absolutely livid as well. Though the truth is, it was never meant to turn out like this. 
On Coruscant, Anakin came up with an idea to make light of such a negative situation. As Padme was returning from her attorney leave, he told her that the Jedi permitted intermingling in the circumstance that an entire planet's population was decreasing or on the edge of falling apart. Kadimundi had several wives and several children. If Anakin and Padme could hide Luke and Leia long enough, they could technically explain their romance away as the two of them being together for the need to keep Naboo alive. Of course, it wasn't that, but in the eyes of the Jedi, they literally and technically had to permit this type of action. There was no saying that they could deny Anakin from trying to help Padme prolong the existence of the Naboo gene pool. It really was a technicality, but how could Anakin not take advantage of it? Though on the downside, it meant he would likely be separated from the 501st, and the reason that was is simply because he'd be required to be around Padme because of her activism in the Senate, and because she was promoting a peaceful campaign to end the war. In other words, Anakin would be with her just to protect her. When the Jedi were informed of Skywalker and Amidala's relationship, they questioned every motivation that Skywalker had, and every question they asked him, he answered with a lie that fit their narrative. Anakin knew that with the High Council, he had to pretend he was who they wanted him to be. The only issue is in the Senate is that many of the senators that knew Padme was on maternity leave believed that she had a husband for longer than the Naboo was destroyed, which was true. And so, the hope was that the senators wouldn't just snitch on them. Which luckily for a married couple, the senators had no real reason to snitch to the Jedi about the relationship. With Padme returning to the Senate, she motioned for a peace treaty to be started with the Separatists, which would result in a treaty almost formulating, and then it would be cut short by the destruction of the Coruscant power grid and the assassination of Mina Bontiri. The Senate was thrusted deeper into the Clone Wars by granting more emergency powers to Palpatine himself. The Dark Lord of the Sith, who was behind everything, learned that there was a secret marriage between Skywalker and Amidala. He realized that there were children involved here too, and so he deviously crafted up a plan to either turn Skywalker to the dark side sooner, or get rid of him so that he could take the children instead. Because it seemed as if Dooku was no longer needed, Palpatine authorized Tarkin to use the Blue Shadow Virus and bomb Dooku's homeworld of Sereno into non-existence. The entire population of Sereno evaporated overnight, and a hundred million lives vanished from the face of the galaxy. It was a painful thing to do, but Sidious didn't care. Dooku was gone, and now he would begin the early steps of his process to overthrow the Jedi. Sure, the war wasn't exactly where he wanted it, but just as Palpatine wanted, the Jedi began to remove themselves from the war effort. The bombing of Sereno went against the morality of the Jedi Code, and they couldn't stand for it. However, something Palpatine miscalculated was the public response to the death of a hundred million people in Sereno. Sure, it wasn't a part of the Republic, but targeting populations did nothing. The Republic was fighting the Separatists, which were made up of battle droids, none of which were affected by the release of the Blue Shadow Virus. All the battle droids on Sereno were perfectly fine, and that was a tragedy of the situation. With the Jedi stepping away from the conflict, Palpatine watched his allies slowly drifted from his side to the other aisle of the Senate to join Senator Amidala in protesting the war effort. To stop the war full-heartedly and allow the governments to begin talks. No peace treaties, just simple talks and a ceasefire. The neutral system coalition led by Mandalor spoke up first, demanding that this conflict be stopped. 700 million people were killed in the span of a month, and the galaxy needed to see this atrocity and forbid it forever continuing again. Jedi Council members Plo Koon, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Master Skywalker, who wasn't on the council, were sent to a covert mission to take every single Blue Shadow virus bomb away from Mount Tantus. Because the Jedi were no longer fighting for the Republic, this would be illegal, but all three Jedi were willing to risk it so that the galaxy didn't have to suffer under the Blue Shadow Virus anymore. When Anakin was on the way to Wayland, he started having dreams of the death of everybody on Coruscant, but it wasn't done by the Republic, Separatists, or even Sith. It was a deliberate action done by the Jedi, and the evil master behind all of it, Plo Koon. Anakin found this repulsive, but he knew Plo Koon, and his student was closely tied with Plo. From the stories Ahsoka told him about Plo Koon, there was no feasible way to believe these visions were true, though he would question Master Yoda about it once they returned to the temple. Ironically, they wouldn't be going to the temple after this, they had other intentions, those being Master Plo's intentions. When the Jedi arrived at Mount Tantus, they landed in the jungles and got out. Sure, they were recognizable Jedi, but no one was meant to know that they were here. This would be incredibly difficult. They would first have to defuse the bombs and then place each of the small containers of the Blue Shadow Virus 
into their bags. The Jedi made their way into the fortress by cutting a hole in the base of the mountain. They traveled through the corridors and large vents, making their way up to the scientific facility. There were men and women present. These weren't clones, and there weren't any visible clones in the facility. These were scientists working on behalf of the Chancellor. This was even more peculiar. Anakin told the Jedi Masters that he would create a distraction and they would get the bioweapon. They could meet outside, and then they would dispose of the weapon where Plo and wanted to. Anakin leapt out of the vent and slammed down on the alarm system, reporting that there was a droid force outside the facility and the landing decks were being locked down. He continued saying that all scientists must report to the administrative sector. Moments later, the scientists abandoned the lab. The two Jedi Masters jumped down and got straight to work, getting all the Blue Shadow viruses up into their bags and departing immediately. With the facility locked down, the Jedi escaped through the entrance that they came in through. When the Jedi got to their ship, they lifted off and flew away from the system undetected. The trip through hyperspace was a long ways away. Anakin had been tired, the visions he had of Plo were eating away at him. He told the other two that he was having visions in his sleep and they were disrupting him. Plo and Obi-Wan suggested that Anakin get rest which is what he was going to do. Plo told Obi-Wan that once Skywalker was in the other room, that the Jedi were onto something. The Sith Lord had been close to Skywalker this entire time. It's the only way. The Sith Lord was reacting based off of the Chancellor's decision to bomb Sereno. That means that the Sith Lord was trying to disrupt the Jedi's plans. Plo told Obi-Wan that they could get the attention of the Sith Lord and possibly include him in the plan to get rid of the Blue Shadow virus. Obi-Wan asked what they would do. Plo told him that they would use the Force to see into Skywalker's mind once he was asleep. They would be able to communicate with the other individual using Skywalker's mind as a plague, and likely be able to draw the Sith Lord to where they were going. Obi-Wan nodded his head, and they waited until Skywalker was asleep. Once he was, they walked into the other room, raising their hands and using the Force to feel into Anakin's mind. The vision was similar to the multitude of other visions. They were haunting, and they showed the Jedi destroying everything Anakin cared about. Plo and Kenobi were surprised when they saw Padme and two children, especially considering this keeping the gene pool alive thing was a relatively new thing, but it was obvious that there was a relationship from before Naboo was destroyed. Truthfully, Plo actually didn't care, and neither did Obi-Wan. It wasn't their concern. What was their concern was the vision. It was the Jedi trying to hunt people, trying to hurt them, and so the Jedi flipped it, drawing on the energy of the individual who was trying to cause this harm on Anakin and reflecting it back towards him. Palpatine was an incredible powerful force user, but he wasn't looking for this. He was defenseless and his defenses were down, and when the vision flopped back on him, the Jedi saw a hooded man. In the dream, they showed the hooded man and then Anakin inside a dream of his own reached for the hood and unveiled Palpatine on the planet they were going to. The Sith Lord was shocked and outraged that he cut off the force from this little vision that Anakin was having. He didn't want the Jedi to dig further, but now he was outraged. He knew what he needed to do. If he didn't act now, then he would be found out by the Jedi. The Jedi already knew who he was because they saw him in the vision. Palpatine immediately departed from Coruscant to go to where the vision had him and Skywalker. The three Jedi landed on a barren world, a world filled with no life and a world with an ancient temple on it. Anakin at this point was fully awake, but Plo instructed him to stay on the ship with the engines warm. Anakin found this a little disrespectful, but he listened. Kenobi and Plo took all the bags out of the ship and placed them on all the pillars in front of the temple. And then, a Republic shuttle landed. Anakin peeked his head out of the vessel and saw a hooded man walk towards his friends. Plo looked at Anakin and held his hand up. Sidious didn't take his time as he ignited his lightsabers and drove his blades forward, trying to kill the Jedi. Plo took the brunt of this hit, deflecting the strikes as Obi-Wan tried to beat back Sidious. Plo knew that this was a battle for the galaxy. If they lost, then Palpatine would do anything to ensure the galaxy belonged to him. Plo used his physical strength to keep Sidious on edge, but even Plo knew he couldn't do this forever. Sidious' speed was incredible, rivaling that of Master Yoda. Obi-Wan and Plo struggled, but using their various forms of lightsaber combat, it permitted them to stand up toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Sith Lord. Kenobi was then thrown from his feet as Sidious threw one of his lightsabers forward. Plo ducked under it as a saber cut through a pillar behind him, knocking over the blue shadow virus as it exploded. The chemicals started to ooze out of the container, Sidious hissed, as Plo slammed his blade down against the Dark Lord. It was enough to shock Sidious and make him stagger his footing. Plo looked at Obi-Wan who was getting to his feet. Plo told Obi-Wan to go, but before he could, Sidious threw his lightsaber forward into Kenobi's knee, stalling him to the ground. 
Plo looked back and saw the virus creeping towards Kenobi, so he did what a Jedi had to do. Plo removed his mask from his face and used the force to attach it to Obi-Wan's face, before using the force to push Kenobi towards the vessel that Anakin was still in. As he did, Sidious ignited his lightsaber. Plo turned around, taking a lightsaber through the stomach. The Jedi Master grabbed Sidious' wrist, and with the tightest grip he could muster, he shattered the entire wrist of Palpatine, while holding the Sith Lord's blade in place inside of his stomach. Once Kenobi was in the vessel, Plo used the force to close the doors behind him, before he turned back towards Sidious, who was trying to tell the Jedi Master to release him. Plo placed his spare hand on Sidious' shoulder, and kept them in place. The blue shadow virus met both of them as it filled their lungs, infecting the two of them. The Jedi shuttle lifted off the ground and departed. The battle was won, but so much had to be fixed. Of course, with the blue shadow virus disposed of on Moraband, the home world of the Sith, there was no reason to assume the virus would ever return. With Palpatine dead, the Jedi and the Senate would collectively figure out that he was behind the Clone Wars, though it would take weeks of investigation. Though when Palpatine died, the Senate would elect a senator who would vie for peace. Both the Republic and the Confederacy were tired of this war. Both Serenu and Naboo became dead worlds, and the price of war wasn't worth it. On the other hand, the Jedi would remember the sacrifice of Master Plo Koon, and remember him for what he did for the galaxy. Obi-Wan would feel a bit of guilt for what happened, but the Sith Lord was dead, and he was glad that Plo could make that sacrifice, the sacrifice of a true Jedi. For Anakin, he would continue living this double life, though this time it would be open, it wouldn't actually be a double life. The Jedi would know openly about his relationship with Padme. As for Luke and Leia, they would never be brought into the Jedi Order in accordance to Padme and Anakin's request that they be allowed to live their lives as normal people, especially to keep the Naboo gene pool alive. The Clone Wars would come to an end after months of peace debates on the peaceful planet of Mandalore. As for Skywalker's apprentice, she would eventually rise to the ranks of the Jedi Order to become Master Ahsoka Tano, in a galaxy that was forever changed without the influence of the Sith. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Tiger Boy, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, Darth Cheesy, Apollo, Mad Many Snooze, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Flynn Van Seas, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Hit 2,000 likes on this video. I don't know what's coming next, but it is. Let's talk about our story. This was fun. I hope you all enjoyed this. This was a um, um, this is something that obviously came from the comment section, but. I, I wanted to do something, of course I always say this, I say this every video, so I'm a broken record at this point, but I wanted to do something interesting, I always want to do something interesting, I always want to make these stories unpredictable, but also as fun as possible, and I thought this would be cool. I wanted the story to start off where you didn't know if she had given birth yet. I tried to set it up where it'd be like kind of nine months after, you know, after they got married, you know, had a little honeymoon fun, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> I'm so weird, I'm sorry, um, and so like, like them them having the little honeymoon retreat like i try to set it up where it'd be like around the time after that and i feel like defenders of peace that like defenders of peace through blue shadow virus is like a good time estimate to work with uh because that's all during the first year of combat and i didn't want to go into the holocron the holocon heist which i could have done and i thought about doing but i wanted to focus on this because I wanted to make it a way. I wanted to make Luke and Leia being born earlier a way for Anakin to actually stay a Jedi, because that's kind of something you don't see coming. Because I think, I think initially when you see this, oh, Anakin's just going to leave the Order earlier, or Anakin's going to turn to the dark side earlier. Well, I'm going to throw a curveball. You know me. I like throwing those curveballs. I think, I think I hit the mark on this one. I really hope you guys like this because this was kind of fun. I had to do a lot of Clone Wars research because it's been a while since I watched the first season of the Clone Wars um, because I've been getting like psyched up for Rebels because you know Ahsoka's coming out <laughs> and. And so um, I, I had to go back and I wanted to make sure I got the timeline correct for all these, you know, like uh, going to using Pantora and the Trespass, um, that, that, arc, that little miniature arc, and then of course the Blue Shadow Virus arc and all that stuff. And this was a lot of fun because I got to, you know, make, make that transition for the Blue Shadow Virus to have a genuine effect because I think the entire purpose of the Blue Shadow Virus was to kill the entire planet. He made it an airborne disease, which means it could go anywhere, literally could affect anybody. And that was the whole point. It's meant to wipe out planets. And I could could see Palpatine just being like, okay, yeah, Dooku, you messed around enough times, and so you're gonna pay for it. And that's what he did. He made Dooku pay for it. And so in the end, I can't, you know, we can't just have a happy ending. I had to kill off one of my favorite Jedi. We had to kill, we had to kill Plo Koon. But you know what? It was a sacrifice uh, that needed to be made, needed to be made for the for the good of the galaxy. And I believe that using Plo in that sacrificial like point was kind of cool because I set it up literally. Uh, literarily instead of literally uh, at the beginning of the story where you know or not the beginning of the story but like where he was 
in Nebu when he went down with the wolf pack and they, they worked on fixing, you know, taking the bombs and then going away. That, that whole 25 minute thing, I wanted to set up his mask to be like impenetrable towards the virus so that later in the story it could kind of work really well, which happened sequentially, sequentially accidentally, which I'm really happy about. And I think it, I think, I think it's cool. I hope you liked it though. Of course, that's the main point of these videos for you guys to like it. You know, I can think it's a cool story, but it's all about how you guys perceive it. So let me know how you like this video down below. Otherwise, I love you all. Spread the love and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.